minutes, but we're going to get started with our introduction. Today is a very exciting day at the Roswell Park Center for Indigenous Cancer Research. As most of you know, this is our monthly webinar series that we have been committed to over the past year or so and featuring our colleagues and community members um, across Indian country. And I think today's discussion is one that we're, we're really in for a treat today because it's a topic that I don't think is appreciated oftentimes. I know when we talk about medicine and wellness uh, and health, sleep sometimes takes a back seat. And uh, maybe Dr. Begay could expand on why that is and, and why it's sometimes overlooked. But I believe based on my understanding that sleep can be a root cause of many of our diseases and many of the uh, issues that we face with chronic health. And I'm, it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Begay today. She was raised on the Navajo Nation. She is Towering House clan, born for Black Streak through Forest. She is a second generation physician and daughter of Ray Begay, MD, a past AAIP president. Melissa completed undergraduate studies at Stanford University and received her MD from the University of New Mexico, UNM School of Medicine. She completed her internship and residency in internal medicine and a fellowship in sleep medicine at UNM, UNM Health Sciences. Dr. Begay practices at the New Mexico VA Sleep Center and is an assistant professor in the UNM Department of Pulmonology, Critical Care and Sleep Medicine. She's a past board member of the We Are Healers, a gold Humanism Society member, and recently recognized as a hometown hero by Senator Martin Heinrich for her work in assisting Native communities during the pandemic. In her free time, Dr. Begay joy, enjoys creating graphic designs and exploring the Southeast in her 60s series Land Cruiser. Dr. Begay, it is a pleasure, and we look forward to your discussion today. Thank you, Will, um, and greetings from New Mexico. Um, I feel so fortunate to be able to give a talk on one of my favorite subjects, sleep. So go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started. Okay, so, um, this is the uh, second lecture that I'm giving um, to Roswell Park. Uh, the first was just a basic introduction, and so I've expanded a little bit on that, but I'm basically going to be giving a um, short introduction to sleep and then ending with some um, uh, discussion on how this affects our tribal communities. So, um, this is a little bit of a pop quiz, I guess. So just think of the answer in your head. Um, but I'd like to start off with how um, much sleep do you humans require? So think about that for a second. We'll come back to that. Um, so why do we need to sleep? Well, sleep is very, very important um, for basic restoration and recovery for the body and the brain. Um, it is a, a mechanism where we strengthen our immune defenses. Um, and in this time of COVID, I think we all think about how we can boost our immune system. Um, and, and, and so what sleep does is it really primes the immune system and, and increases the uh, productivity of cells that are essential to carry on this daily work. Um, in young children, it's also very important for brain growth and development. Uh, sleep is a time when um, complex neural networks are being created. Um, and as we age, uh, we undergo um, tremendous repair of all our cells and also our central nervous system. Uh, sleep is essential for maintaining a normal body and hormonal functions. And then Every day throughout the lifespan, we are constantly learning and um, trying to consolidate our daily experiences and, and memory. And some of this occurs uh, during sleep. So um, what we know about sleep has really come out of um, our studies on animals and how animals sleep. And it turns out that um, animals sometimes can sleep like humans, but um, 
really animals carry out some of the same functions as humans. Um, and then they also at times uh, may suffer from uh, diseases of sleep that humans encounter. Uh, when I was an undergrad at Stanford, I was uh, fortunate to take this lecture by Dr. William Demet, the father of sleep medicine. And on the first day of class, he brought in these uh, narcoleptic dogs um, who would basically uh, try to eat food and that was a stimulus uh, to fall asleep. And so you had these narcoleptic dogs running around the classroom. But um, animals uh, undergo some of the, the same types of um, sleep disorders. So what we know about sleep is really based on how these uh, studies on animals have informed us. And it's really led to um, understanding that uh, sleep is essential for survival. And in dolphins, um, they display a unique pattern of sleeping where they only sleep with one uh, side of their uh, brain, which is called unihemispheric sleep. And uh, they do this and they swim in a circle and they can have one side of their brain working. And at the same time, they can also have one eye working. And really that is to maintain survival in the ocean at the same time, uh, reach, achieve sleep. And in birds in their migratory season, they only sleep one third of the time when they are traveling. And so these unique patterns uh, really provide insight into how sleep is essential for uh, survival. Um, and it really has uh, guided our uh, understanding and research on sleep. So what is sleep? Uh, sleep is not an inactive state. It is a very active state. And there are various sleep stages uh, that uh, we encounter throughout the night. I'll go through some of this, but uh, you may have heard of uh, sleep stages, REM, uh, also the, the rock band, but also rapid eye movement where we uh, achieve some deep sleep. And there are various uh, characteristic brain waves throughout the night that define each, each stage. If any of you have undergone a, a sleep study, um, you, you may have uh, learned about some of this. But uh, really what happens is that uh, sleep is a characteristic display of patterns throughout the night. Here we have a, a snapshot of sleep in one night. What happens is that um, we go through cycles of sleep. So we begin in an awake state. We go from lighter, lighter uh, stages of sleep to deeper sleep to then rapid eye movement uh, sleep in which uh, dreams take place. And so in a normal adult human, uh, you really should be uh, going through these patterns uh, every night. And so when we do a sleep study, um, we're able to um, ascertain these uh, patterns. So these are some of the characteristic sleep waves, my uh, very favorite squigglies, I like to tell my students, but these are uh, various EEG patterns and they define the different uh, stages of sleep. And so you, you can tell just by uh, looking at them that they're uh, different in size and in amplitude and also in uh, frequency. Um, in the wake state, um, so this is what your brain should look like right now if I'm not boring you to sleep. Um, you should have these uh, alpha waves, um, which are the uh, waves that you see here in this photo. So this photo is just a snapshot of a brain EEG taken during a sleep study. Um, the first two lines are your eye movements. The green line is your chin muscle tone and then frontal, central, occipital uh, EEG patterns, and then the last one is heart rate. And so when you're awake, um, your eyes are scanning the environment and, and your brain displays this uh, predominant uh, wave pattern called alpha. And then hopefully you're not too tachycardic and, and your heart rate um, can also be uh, pretty, should be pretty low. As we move through the night, we enter um, light uh, sleep. And so here again, you can see just a very slight change in the um, EEG pattern. Um, and then also you can see some of these waves changing where it has a smaller amplitude and mixed frequency. And again, you have um, slow eye movements at the top. As we enter the next stage, we begin to see um, what are called sleep spindles. And so these are these uh, rapid uh, periods of, of waves here that sort of look like uh, squished caterpillars, I like to tell my students. And then you also have K complexes, which are these big waves that start to occur, meaning that you're going to enter a uh, deep sleep. 
So deep sleep, uh, stage three, um, you can see larger waves here that are in indicative of uh, very, very deep sleep. So this is a type of pattern that we often see in people on the night after um, perhaps they uh, were sleep deprived and the next night they enter this very uh, deep restorative sleep. And then finally, um, if you're lucky, then you enter rapid eye movement sleep. So this is REM sleep um, characterized by these uh, rapid movements in the eyes going up and down. Um, and interestingly enough, this looks very similar to uh, awake sleep. Um, and so sometimes it's a little bit hard to tell the difference, um, but this is a rat, you have um, rapid eye movement. Um, hopefully your muscles are very still and not working because if you were to be dreaming, you, you would act out your dreams and that could be a, a dangerous. Also, you have these uh, characteristic sawtooth waves in the middle here, it kind of looks like a sawtooth pattern. Then you also exhibit heart rate variability where you can see at the bottom, the heart rate can jump from 120 uh, beats a minute uh, to uh, 70. So you can have some of this acceleration and deceleration of your heart rate. Um, and this very much looks like awake, but it really is a, a dream sleep. So how many hours of sleep do I need? Hopefully we can answer this at the end of the lecture, but um, what we have found that is it may be uh, based on uh, your genetics. So we have discovered that we have these clock genes um, that you inherit uh, from your parents um, that account for a sort of natural uh, circadian rhythm that your body um, is attuned to. So on these uh, clock genes, uh, they were discovered in the, in the fly and it really is responsible for the circadian rhythm that we all have. And, and some people have a, a typical a clock gene, which means that you require seven to nine hours of sleep. Um, and in some cases you may uh, have the short clock gene, meaning that you are blessed enough to get along with only four hours of sleep. Um, I think the owner of Ferrari was a, had a typical short clock gene where he only had four hours of sleep and that was completely healthy for him. Or in some cases, you could have a long clock gene, meaning that you need 11, 12, 13 hours of sleep. Um, but typically, most adults fall in the bell curve and that you will require between seven and nine hours of sleep. So next, let's talk about what influences sleep and what can disrupt it or what can uh, make sleep better. Um, so we have found that there are uh, certain cues strong environmental and social cues uh, called zeitgeivers uh, that influence sleep. And the strongest one is, is light, um, the timing of food, uh, social activity. Uh, these are all things that can greatly influence, influence one's uh, sleeping pattern. And again, this is based on the interaction of the zeitgeivers with uh, certain uh, parts of the brain. For instance, uh, the Superchiasmatic nucleus is the main uh, human circadian rhythm generator or internal clock, and that's located in the anterior hypothalamus. But this center consists of 10,000 neurons that's responsible for um, sensing your own innate circadian rhythm and when it is time uh, to, to rest and time to be awake. And so we have found that lesions of the SCN basically result in loss of this uh, circadian rhythm. Um, in that um, lesions uh, due to tumor or trauma or dementia can uh, really affect um, the, the, its uh, natural um, function. And that the sleep-wake cycle is then unable to synchronize or, or link up with the um, external light and dark uh, cycle. And, and what also influences this is also um, melatonin. You may have heard of melatonin as a, as a vitamin supplement or seen it in your local grocery store. But what happens is that um, sleep follows this circadian rhythm. And this is just a picture showing um, a typical uh, a day for somebody. But what happens is that uh, on the top part, you, we have sleep drive. So this is a natural innate rhythm of when you feel sleepy and when you feel awake. So hopefully, 
if you are a um, operating on a normal circadian rhythm, uh, the sun comes up and you feel less sleepy. And then as you go throughout the day, uh, that sleep drive increases. And the sleep drive um, increases uh, so much that um, at a certain point in the night, hopefully you fall asleep well. And then that sleep drive dissipates throughout the day um, as we enter the morning hours. And then on the bottom here, you have your natural circadian clock that's also interacting um, where you should feel, um, again, uh, when the sun comes up, your circadian uh, clock should indicate that you should be awake. And as time goes on, uh, you should uh, get more sleepy. And then the cycle continues um, on and on. Um, the sleep drive has certain peaks for people. And if um, you are, sometimes you may feel that after lunch between three and four o'clock, you could get very sleepy. And that also is a peak of when the sleep drive is very strong. And so what about melatonin and, and light? Um, so what basically happens is that light from the sun or blue light from electronics um, enters your eye in, in the retina and uh, goes on this um, ophthalmic track and will uh, affect the circadian clock uh, that we talked about and, and basically um, can either promote or disrupt signals to your body um, and affect your sleep greatly. Um, and what about melatonin? You may have heard of melatonin as a uh, sleep aid or promoter of sleep, um, but what melatonin does here in the red color is that um, it is melatonin is secreted at the highest peak when you are asleep, and then it um, decreases as you wake up. So melatonin is a helper of this natural circadian rhythm. It's secreted by the pineal gland, and it is a helper of the suprachiasmatic nucleus to sense the length of night. Um, again, in an era of electronics and technology, you may have heard that bright light, um, specifically blue light from electronics or the TV computers can suppress this melatonin secretion. And in time, um, as we age, melatonin secretion also decreases. So uh, melatonin, uh, again, the highest peak levels occur when you're uh, in the middle of your uh, sleep cycle. And, and melatonin really acts as a chemical timekeeper. And, and in sleep medicine, we use melatonin to assist people who are having uh, trouble with their natural circadian rhythm. And we can use this uh, medication, this vitamin in resetting this internal clock. So now let's talk about poor sleep. Um, I'm sure everyone here has experienced a, a sleepless night and has felt the effects the next day. Um, but poor sleep really um, is detrimental uh, to basic uh, daily functions in that it really causes a neurocognitive impairment and, um, and decline in brain function. Um, so if you are awake 17 hours or pulling a a night, uh, you know, a call shift, or um, you are a caregiver and awake for many hours. Um, you really can sense this uh, decline in psychomotor performance. And so, really, um, studies have taken uh, sleep-deprived adults and compared them with uh, people who were uh, impaired, and it really um, shows that it is very similar to somebody who is um, having alcohol impairments. And after 24 hours of being awake. Uh, the impairment was actually equivalent to a blood alcohol tent, uh, content of 0 0.1, uh, or sorry, with a 0.1%. So this shows the profound uh, detrimental effect that uh, poor sleep can have on uh, neurocognition. Uh, and also, it also shows that um, creativity and higher order executive functioning are compromised. And poor sleep um, is, is, is very uh, detrimental to many um, body systems. And so um, I thought this graph was a, a nice snapshot of what we're going to discuss, but sleep disruption really has um, both physiological effects. So effects on the, um, not only your psychosocial self, but also on uh, pulmonary system, uh, 
cardiac system and the metabolic uh, system. So sleep disruption has a uh, true physiologic effects in that it can increase uh, cortisol and stress levels. It can disrupt your natural uh, circadian rhythm. It also has been shown to affect uh, glucose and blood sugar levels and that it makes insulin less sensitive. Um, sleep disruption has also been shown to increase appetite and also alter the hormones that um, allow you to sense when you are full and when you are hungry. And, and so if you have ever pulled an all-nighter, you might notice that you, for some reason, in the middle of the night, become ravenous for, for junk food. Usually it's chips or something. Um, and it, so you could increase your appetite. It also shows that um, if you are deprived of sleep, you actually need um, increase uh, oxygen consumption. And then again, you show this disruption in the immune system where you have up, um, regulation of what we call reactive oxygen uh, species, um, which um, can lead to free radicals and also can lead to DNA um, injury. And also you can see that uh, melatonin production will also be de decreased. So all these uh, consequences of sleep disruption basically lead to a short-term and long-term uh, ill consequences on your health. Uh, so stress, uh, psychosocial issues, and in the long term, um, you really are placing uh, oneself at risk for increased cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease, obesity, diabetes, cancer, and increased risk of mortality and morbidity. And so today, uh, as, a, as a sleep medicine physician, uh, these are all the um, these are all the issues that we have to deal with when we're speaking with patients who are suffering from a sleep disorder. And for many of you that work in the cancer field, uh, sleep and cancer research is, is uh, very um, interesting in that um, more research is happening every day. But when we look at our patients with cancer, we have found that um, at least half of the cancer patients report sleep difficulty. And so this can be uh, poor sleep, poor sleep efficiency, efficiency. insomnia is one of the um, big ones, uh, especially for patients who are suffering from breast and gynecologic cancers. 20% meet uh, criteria for diagnosis of insomnia. So insomnia, difficulty going to sleep. Um, and unfortunately, some of the medications and the chemotherapy that we give patients disrupts this uh, circadian uh, rhythm and cycle that I was talking about earlier. And again, um, it is quite difficult when you're uh, evaluating the patient for sleep complaints because they also have um, concurrent fatigue. Fatigue is reported in up to 70 to 100% of patients during treatment. And after treatment, this fatigue at times does not go away. And you can also have a uh, somatic or body uh, symptoms such as pain, um, nausea, vomiting that can disrupt uh, sleep and the sleep cycle. And so we are um, searching every day for uh, treatment for this. Um, in, in sleep clinic, sometimes medications are beneficial. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia remains one of the primary standards uh, treatment for insomnia. We can also use um, mindfulness stress reduction and also physical um, activity to try to boost the um, natural circadian rhythm and, and try to get uh, patients to sleep a little better. So um, some of the work that I am focusing on is on uh, sleep in, in Native America and in our tribal communities. And as one of the uh, few sleep uh, Native sleep physicians, uh, in the field, um, the, the data is limited, but um, I will present uh, what we're working on and what I have found. So as many of you might know that health uh, is, the health status is um, definitely linked to, to sleep health and health status in Native America uh, is quite poor. Um, approximately uh, the, the life is expectancy is 73 years and it's five and a half years uh, less than other races. Uh, the leading cause of death remains uh, heart disease, cancer, and accidents. And our communities continue to be afflicted with high rates of comorbid disease. Um, adults are more than twice as likely than uh, white adults to be diagnosed with diabetes type two. 
And a survey in 2018 found that almost 50%, half of American Indian adults have a BMI of 30 or greater. So uh, an epidemic of obesity. And then in many communities uh, continue to be uh, superimposed with environmental issues such as uh, my reservation, abandoned uranium mines uh, and pollution. And so we have uh, tremendous challenges affecting our communities and in this regard. And in terms of sleep apnea, um, some of you may know somebody with sleep apnea where they wear a CPAP machine at night to keep their airway open uh, because the back of the airway, the posterior pharynx is closing at night. Uh, this is called obstructive sleep apnea. But obstructive sleep apnea has found to be independently associated with uh, diabetes. And um, the sleep heart health study showed that short sleep time, meaning uh, remember seven to nine hours of sleep is typical, but less than six hours of sleep has been associated with a one and a half to two and a half higher risk for diabetes and a one in, and 1.4 times higher risk for hypertension or high blood pressure uh, with people with severe obstructive sleep apnea. And in 2003, JNC7 identified obstructive sleep apnea as a treatable and independent cause of hypertension. Um, and so when we begin to look at our tribal communities, all of you know that we have an obesity epidemic. Uh, many people suffer from diabetes cardiovascular disease. Um, when we have uh, looked at surveys, uh, um, looked at adults, we found that uh, those adults in these tribal communities um, who were undergoing uh, participation in a special diabetes project where they were trying to um, give lifestyle interventions basically showed that uh, in adults who slept less than six hours, they definitely had an increased risk of, of diabetes. So this is very concerning to us as sleep physicians. Um, and what about uh, the impact of poverty? So there are many studies that show that racial and ethnic minorities have a shorter or longer sleep time, um, which may be associated with increased mortality and morbidity, uh, sleeping too short, less than six hours, sleeping too long, greater than 12, 13 hours, uh, both have its risks. And, um, and an analysis of, of data available to us showed that um, American Indians compared to white adults basically reported very uh, short sleep time, less than four hours in some cases, uh, less than six hours um, in some cases. And in, in those populations, there were even adults who reported very long sleep times. And, and so um, this was impacted by um, poverty, but for American Indians, it showed that they had um, increased um, short sleepers and long sleepers. And so what does this mean for our tribal communities? Um, it means that we are a perfect uh, setup for poor sleep. Um, so again, um, in summary, uh, when you think about poor sleep, um, sleep is very complicated. You have the organic, part and then you also have the uh, psychosocial issues. So you have um, economic uh, conditions, poverty, uh, people who work, who have to work, um, shift work, people who have to travel very far outside of their tribal communities to find a job. Um, we have uh, the neighborhood in which tribal communities uh, live in, uh, the impact of light and pollution, uh, being in a safe neighborhood, um, sleeping at night, if you feel safe, having a comfortable place to sleep. Um, and then we have the epidemic of obesity and the core morbid conditions that afflict our, our tribal communities. And then we also have uh, cultural practices that may affect how our beliefs about sleep and how we sleep. Uh, but basically some of these things come together and, and create a, just a nidus for uh, communities having poor sleep, which leads to poor diet cardiovascular disease and poor mental health. And so, um, you know, when we're all suffering from COVID right now and the, the pandemic, and we have learned that um, obesity and cardiovascular disease 
it really puts you at risk for uh, having severe illness from COVID. Uh, these are all the things that, that we have to think about and, and figure out how we can start changing. And so again, in summary, sleep in Native America. Uh, American Indians report uh, less sleep, shorter sleep. Um, there are many health disparities and sleep disparities that exist in tribal communities uh, that affect quality of life. Um, and then there are also uh, research on the impact of psychosocial stress, uh, specifically historical trauma and adverse childhood events that could also lead to issues with uh, chronic insomnia, so difficulty sleeping, um, and the role of increased um, vigilance, not feeling safe, uh, constantly feeling you have to check the door, uh, being hyper aware of noises. Um, some of this is associated with uh, trauma, intergenerational trauma um, and PTSD. So, so these are, are lots of challenges that um, we are looking at. So how do we navigate through these challenges and what uh, positive uh, systems are in place for us to, to battle these? So when we look at um, indigenous perspectives of sleep, uh, it's very interesting because as many of you know, um, the concept of health to uh, many indigenous communities and tribal communities is that health is really a balance of the physical, mental, and, and spiritual worlds in which we live in. And so um, we must maintain balance with the world and the environment around us. And uh, for many traditional healers, uh, sleep disruption is viewed as a reflection of imbalance. And also we have to think about how uh, modern schedules and technology in our tribal communities, how that may have disrupted that balance. So um, there are actually many studies taking place looking at this. And this is one that I found um, fascinating. Uh, it was one out of, I, I believe, the University of Washington. But it looked at the role of um, access to, to light and electricity. So they studied two indigenous communities in Northern Argentina that um, were pretty identical in terms of socioeconomic uh, status and language and culture, um, the Toba Quam uh, communities and, com and, um, and studied them. And the way they studied them is that they uh, gave them all uh, what we call wrist activity loggers or actigraphy watches, um, which measures um, activity, movement, and exposure to light. This is some of the same technology that exists in, in wearables like uh, your eye watch or your uh, Garmin watches. And, 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 and so studied these two communities for one week in the summer and one week in the winter. And one community, the main difference is that one community had access to light. They were on the grid, so they had access to electricity and the other community did not have any access to electricity or light. And what they basically found um, that the community that was on the grid was basically they slept less than the community that did not have access to light. So in this graph here, uh, you can see that um, the x-axis is activity and on the y-axis is is time um, and so when you go from sunset to sunrise the community that slept longer you actually just see less activity because they're asleep and the community that slept shorter had less activity in the uh, at the zero point so this was a fascinating study uh, showing how late in artificial light specifically and electricity basically led to a shorter sleep time. And so these communities that had access to electricity were able to uh, likely stay up later. Uh, they may have had a TV um, and they uh, basically had access to things in the evening time when they weren't able to follow the natural circadian rhythm uh, to just stay up later uh, in the night.
And so what is the, the effect of, of this um, on many communities? And in my own tribe, um, I'm currently studying uh, sleep from a traditional aspect, but again, this fits in, in pattern that sleep disruption is, a, um, is seen as, as an, an imbalanced um, issue. Uh, but basically in my tribe, there is a concept of this balance that we call hojo and it's harmony that leads to health and wellness. And so when sleep disruption occurs, it is seen by many traditional healers as, um, as something that is a reflection of the imbalance of the physical and spiritual world. So whether that is a patient with nightmares, uh, anxiety, insomnia, and whatever the sleep problem is, is a reflection of that imbalance. And in many, um, when we think about how tribes and, and different communities view sleep, their belief on sleep, it really is, is pretty varied. Um, in my community, sleep is not really seen as um, something that you want to do too often. <laughs> um, as you know, when kids are growing up, you're taught not to nap. You're taught to wake up very early before the sun comes up to do your prayers and you're not supposed and you're supposed to go to sleep right when the sun goes down and not be outside at night and so when we look at the oral uh, traditions and the traditional stories of sleep in, in Navajo community you have the story even of the hero twins here who are the twin warriors um, and one of the main uh, deities in Navajo culture who were on a journey to find their father, the sun. And along the way, these twin warriors, Monster Slayer and Born for Water, they encountered different monsters. And, in, and one of these monsters um, was uh, sleep. So there was old age, poverty, licensed sleep. And sleep was allowed to live because it was important. Um, so, uh, also old age and in poverty because they taught us something. Um, but we have stories about sleep. And so uh, our belief on, on sleep and the cultural aspects of sleep definitely can influence our communities. And when people have problems with sleep, um, they typically don't go to a sleep doctor, but in many cases they will uh, be told to have a ceremony. A uh, blessing way ceremony is um, the pillar of Navajo uh, philosophy where uh, you undergo ceremony to become balanced again, to be um, with Hojo again. And uh, studies on uh, these ceremonies and mindfulness meditation have shown that they, they might be affecting uh, the balance of neurotransmitters in the brain. So these neurotransmitters are also very important in sleep and wake. Um, there are certain neurotransmitters in the brain that tell us when to be awake. So dopamine, histamine, um, serotonin, uh, these are wake promoting neurotransmitters and they interact also with sleep promoters in creating a very uh, delicate balance of sleep and wake. So what can we do um, to restore sleep? So we, can think about um, exercises such as mindfulness. Um, we can support uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, which is a set of uh, skills that you learn along with sleep hygiene on how to uh, reset your thinking about sleep and how to promote um, good habits and how to get rid of bad habits about sleep, like a clock watching and staying in bed. Um, we can think about the role of ceremony and how um, perhaps some patients uh, might be benefited by that. And think about the ways we can restore our natural circadian rhythm. There are studies coming out that shows uh, two days of camping might reset this internal circadian rhythm. So how can we live in balance with the environment? And how might we isolate ourselves from the world in a sense of from technology, blue light stressors to, to restore our sleep? And, and this is very important. Um, this indig our indigenous worldview, our indigenous health systems as these systems have been practiced and strengthened 
um, by our traditional healers and our knowledge keepers for thousands of years. Um, and as uh, physicians, especially native physicians, um, how can we be agents of change to improve health in our tribal communities? How can we be an advocate for these health systems? And how can we begin to in integrate this knowledge system into our educational curricula? So we're nearing the end here, um, but again, um, what can lead to better sleep? So I often tell my patients that it, it's complicated, but we can get through it. The number one thing is to know your sleep needs. Again, remembering how this is partially determined by genetics, by these clock genes. So you might ask your parents if you have an atypical sleeping pattern, um, you might ask your parents how they slept. So you might be an early bird, um, or you may be a night owl. So you can learn about how your parents slept and maybe that might inform your own personal sleeping patterns. Um, again, now that you know about circadian, circadian rhythm and blue lights, um, we can decrease your blue light exposure. Really one to two hours before bedtime should not be watching TV or being on your computer because this blue light uh, basically is kind of sending mixed signals to your brain that, hey, maybe you should be awake, but no, it's the wrong signal. You should be going to sleep. Um, and again, some basic um, habits are avoiding caffeine, alcohol, smoking, late night eating before bedtime, maintain a regular exercise schedule. Um, and then also, this is very important, maintain a consistent sleep schedule. Um, so what this means is regular bed and wake times every day, even on vacation, which can be sometimes difficult, but consistency is key for better sleep. And I sometimes give this uh, lecture to residents, but um, don't tweet late at night. Don't be on Twitter or Facebook or TikTok. Um, they actually did studies on NBA players and, and studied how they were tweeting and found that people who were tweeting late at night um, didn't do so well athletically the next day. Um, limit your caffeine intake. Uh, there is a great website uh, by the military called To Be Alert that actually can tell you based on some demographics and uh, habitus that, you know, how caffeine can best uh, be implemented by yourself. Um, if you suffer from insomnia, um, you should really think about uh, how you're going to deal with this before you go to bed. Um, set your bedtime. If you wake up in the middle of the night, write down a list of what you're thinking about, the problems that you're trying to solve or things that are bothering you in a notebook. Keep that on the side of your bed so when you can't sleep, you can write in it and deal with it the next day. And don't watch the clock if you can't sleep at night. Um, Clock watching is very bad. So only use your clock for an alarm, a wake up time. And if you can't stay in bed, or if you, sorry, if you can't sleep, don't stay in bed for more than 20 minutes. Because what happens is that um, you are conditioning your brain that the bed is a place where you don't sleep and you create this bad habit that continues again and again. So get out of bed, go to a dimly lit room and do something partially mundane, read the newspaper, uh, do something quietly that's not too stimulating and then only go to sleep when you're sleepy. Uh, make sure that your bedroom environment is comfortable, have a cool room. People often sleep better when it's slightly cold. Um, buy some blackout curtains to keep out the artificial light and noise. Invest in earplugs if you have to and an eye mask. These things will uh, help promote your natural circadian rhythm. And people usually ask about naps, but um, napping is okay because sleep is sleep in a 24 hour period. Um, you do build up a sleep debt over time. And sometimes we do need to take a nap if we have to do something very important or if you're driving somewhere and perhaps you're drowsy and you have a long trip to go on, naps are okay. Uh, my suggestion is that you avoid very long naps. Um, and as it's shown that very long naps, greater than 60 or 90 minutes um, will force you to enter into certain sleep stages 
that will actually be detrimental to your sleep that night. So if you must nap, keep it short. And again, if you uh, are really suffering from sleeping problems, um, insomnia is, is one of the most prevalent sleeping problems in society. Sleep apnea, if you're uh, sleeping, uh, you have a sleep partner and you are noticing they are snoring, stopping breathing in sleep, choking in sleep. And if you are just really suffering from daily disruption by poor sleep, so sleepy you can't complete tasks, falling asleep um, while driving, um, falling asleep while uh, sitting for long periods of time, then perhaps you should come see a sleep professional as there are over 300 sleep disorders that we have to think about, but some of the common ones are sleep apnea, obstructive and central sleep apnea, insomnia, restless legs, narcolepsy. Um, and then I often get asked this by uh, fellows and residents who often don't sleep, but there is something called hypnic jerks where uh, you may have noticed this in yourself or your bed partner where you're falling asleep, falling asleep, and then you have a big body jerk and it either scares you or scares the person you're, you're sitting or sleeping by. Um, that could be a sign of sleep deprivation. Um, and then also parasomnias, uh, nightmares, night terrors, um, acting out dreams when you're in that REM sleep. Um, these are all some of the things that, that we deal with in a typical sleep clinic. And so reach out to your local sleep physician and we'd be happy to evaluate you. So that is the, the end. And um, thank you for bearing with me. That was a lot of information in a short period of time. But those are the highlights that I thought I'd like to share with you today. And you can email me mbegay at salude.unm.edu. That was amazing. I think you covered a lot of ground in 45 minutes, you know, from the scientific aspects uh, to the cultural implications, practical, pragmatic steps that our attendees can can follow, at least be aware of. And I and I do believe that many people are unaware of that our lifestyle behaviors, our environments, and even uh, you, you touched on trauma and sleep. And that was one of my questions before you hit that slide was the association between trauma and poor sleep quality or sleep deprivation in our uh, indigenous communities. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense. And I, and I do believe that you really highlighted the importance um, of, of sleep from a cultural perspective, as well as, as well as a perspective from 2020, how this affects our, our communities today. So mm -hmm. questions, we, our first question is, are there certain foods, plants, teas that will help in aiding sleep? Thank you. Sure. Um... So that is also that is a very popular question uh, from Ivy. <laughs> but um, as we all know that the, if you've ever had a, a large meal with turkey, a tryptophan, that definitely is a sleep uh, promoter. Um, so foods that are high in tryptophan, especially uh, cherries, turkey, um, some of those may uh, be helpful in, if you're not able to go to sleep. Um, the, there are a lot of research right now on plants and teas. Um, so my answer is this, because vitamins and supplements are not regulated by the FDA right now, uh, there are no particular uh, plants or teas that we promote in aiding sleep. Uh, the one vitamin that we promote is melatonin. And so uh, melatonin in small doses um, usually can be found in your local grocery store. Um, it, again, not regulated by the FDA, so you don't know how much melatonin you're getting. But typically, I tell patients one to three milligrams is all that you would need 30 minutes before bed to see if that could um, improve your uh, sleeping cycle. And speaking on uh, some of the research, are you familiar with the research that's been conducted on blue light blocking glasses? I know that that was one of the highlights of your discussion today was the effect of blue light. And uh, from your professional perspective, are blue light blocking glasses appropriate? Are they effective? Is there sufficient amount of research to recommend them? Sure. So I think um, 
I'm not sure about the particular blue light blocking glasses you're speaking of, but uh, typically um, this is very beneficial in um, blocking blue light, especially for people who work night shift. So if you're working night shift or somebody who has a work schedule that has to flip flop, anything that can block your exposure to light and that can just be big glasses like five dollar glasses you get from walmart or something um and, and that have the sides on them so your exposure to light hitting your retina is limited any of those lights when you're getting off night shift and you're making your way driving your way to your house um and then also um limiting uh, your exposure on your way home and then when you get home having blackout curtains all that can can really help you try to maintain a consistent schedule um, for night shift workers now in terms of when you're going to sleep if you're just on a regular schedule definitely limiting your exposure to blue light two hours before bedtime is beneficial and blue light um, is a specific uh, wavelength but um, it's usually emitted by your phone your tv your computer screen and also some of the LED lights in your house can also have blue light. So very dim light um, as you're getting ready to go to bed is beneficial. And on many iPhone and iPad applications, there is a button where you can train your phone um, or tell your phone to, to limit the blue light, change the light that's coming from your screen at a certain amount of time. And I have my time set two hours before my typical bedtime. So that can definitely help. Oh, that's, that's wonderful information. So what I'm hearing there is get outside, get outside, spend some time outdoors. I mentioned, I heard, I saw that in one of your slides, there was a study that showed that just two nights outside exposed to natural light, the natural ebb and flows of nature, and it can restore your, your, your natural circadian rhythm. Um, and of course, in nature, we're away from electricity. We're away from most times, I think we sort of pull technology into that, but if we're really truly our hearts into it, we're, we're limiting our exposure to all those potential insults. So there's a great potential there for people to change their sleep hygiene, just to, to change the way they're sleeping just by altering our behavior. Now, granted, it's not easy. So that leads to my next question is, I know that over the years that I've suffered from insomnia, I've worked third shifts, I've worked overnights, and really, really had a difficult time covering from that. But over time, after after recognizing that it was important that I pay more attention to my sleep, I made changes. It took some time, but I eventually went from sleeping at one, two o'clock in the morning to 12 o'clock, then 11, then to 10. And now I'm finding a natural range between nine and 10 o'clock, which falls right in line with the circadian rhythms you outlined in your slides. From your professional perspective, how difficult is it to restore a healthy sleep pattern and an otherwise unhealthy person who is suffering from insomnia or the other sleep disorders you that you outline there. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's a great question. Um, so there are different types of insomnia, actually, and um, and you know I work with a um, a large population, and I also work with veterans who off, who are often dealing with nightmares and PTSD um, for years, but. Um, it, it takes some time. And the reason why it takes some time is that often insomnia has been happening for years. And by the time a patient gets to a sleep physician, it's often been at that point chronic, five years, 10 years. Um, so one, it really depends on what type of insomnia you have. You could have short-term sort of acute insomnia perhaps something stressful happened to you in your life. Maybe you lost a relative or um, some big event happened, you have a baby or something and, and you can have acute insomnia and that's usually a little bit easier to deal with. But for chronic insomnia, what happens is that first we, we must make sure that you do not have sleep apnea. So often patients will come and they say, I can't get to sleep we perform a sleep study and find out that they have very severe sleep insomnia where they are stopping breathing in sleep, their oxygen is going to the seventies and their brain is waking up because they are literally choking. Um, so we have to first make sure you don't have another cause of insomnia such as um, sleep apnea or restless legs. And then after we have ruled those other conditions out, then we can think about 
what's causing your insomnia. So insomnia is based on, um, you can have difficulty going to sleep. So if you take more than 20, 30 minutes to get to bed, you can have insomnia where you have, you're fine going to sleep, but for some reason you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't go back to sleep and you wake up for hours. And then there's insomnia that um, you wake up too early. So it, it kind of depends on which insomnia you have. But to answer your question, um, it is definitely worth it to try to fix it. And in my experience, um, the role of cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, CBTI, is definitely underutilized um, in sleep health and by people. CBTI was invented by the military and it's often, it's actually used for other disorders such as anxiety, um, eating disorders, but really it's a set of sessions that somebody goes through, they're typically one hour sessions where you talk about sleep hygiene, make sure you educate yourself on the good sleep health, healthy tips that we um, covered in this lecture. And then also recognizing the things that um, the promoters of good sleep and the bad influencers of sleep and reversing that. So I would say for a typical patient that usually takes about a month and so for somebody who's been suffering for years, a month's time may not be, you know, that, that may actually be worth it. But it definitely takes um, a, the, a, a lot of work from the patient to undergo these sessions. Well, that was, it's a much shorter amount of time than I was expecting. And I, that, bring, that makes me very hopeful too. I know I have many friends and family members who suffer so to know that if they are willing and I think that's an important caveat there to remember is that it's a lot of work on behalf of the patient. It involves making sacrifices. And, you know, for the Haudenosaunee, specifically the Seneca people, taking ownership over your health was a community responsibility and obligation to do that. You know, as we looked at the world, the creator gave us these wonderful tools and, and people to help us through these challenging times like sleep uh, or balance. Mm -hmm. Or, or issues with our mental health, it's our, our responsibility too. So it's, you know, we're, we're lucky to have uh, people like yourself, Dr. Begay, who are uh, navigating us through these complicated issues and sleep, it doesn't get much more complicated than sleep for many people. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, we all have to take ownership too and want to make those changes. But to know that with your help and with, with will and direction, we can recover from these things so quickly is very, very inspiring to me. I would have thought you would have said six months or a year, but to know that somebody can suffer for so long and in a short period of time, see some meaningful results is really wonderful. So I think we're winding down here in our time. You want to make any closing remarks? So I just want to uh, say, thank you for inviting me again. And um, it really is one of my, uh, my most favorite subjects to talk about. And so um, being able to share with you. And I hope that I've given you some good information and perhaps um, help those who might be uh, suffering from sleep and, and perhaps uh, will be helpful to somebody in terms of uh, leading to better sleep. Wonderful. And for everybody who may want to learn more or they maybe they missed some slides and they want the information, this discussion will be recorded and it will be on the Roswell Park YouTube channel. So you can just uh, search that into your YouTube search box and it will pop right up. And so you'll have all the slides available to you. If you'd like this, the actual slides, uh, please contact myself or Dr. McGain. We need that too, because there's so many wonderful practical tips in there that I'm sure everybody would be interested to have those at their disposal. So Nyawi, everybody, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again this time in March.